um, to the the Thursday's meeting. Uh, again, we're using the, the hybrid format. Format. Um, we're quoted. Um, if you have any issues with Starleaf, uh, make, make them known through the the WhatsApp facility here, and um, make, mute your microphones until you need to speak, because all uh, background noise will be heard. And the the meeting, the record the proceedings will be recorded and broadcast through apartment buildings and online. And use mobile devices so long as you're muted. Um, we'll move into a closed session at the end of the meeting uh, to have a strategic planning session. And if members, as many members as possible, can remain, that would be uh, really helpful. Um, the first item on the agenda this morning is apologies. We don't have any. Uh, chairperson's business, there's none. And draft minutes. Uh, the draft minutes of the meeting on the 9th of September, at page 6. And can I seek agreement for the minutes? So if you, you nod your head, I, 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 that'll do. And uh, okay, I'll turn, sign them shortly. Um, there's no matters arising. Um, we are, the next item on the agenda is an oral evidence session uh, from NILGA on the Climate Change Number 1 Bill. We're just waiting for the officials uh, to join us. So whilst we are waiting for the officials to join us, we will uh, jump on to correspondence at item number 8. Uh, to deal with that there, and then we can go back whenever the NILGO officials join us. So item number eight uh, on the agenda is uh, correspondence at page 54. I want to draw members' attention to the following. Uh, there's correspondence from NILGA at page 911 with a formal invite for the committee to view the zero carbon bus as part of its COP26 carbon bus tour when it stops at Parliament Buildings on the, uh, at 10.45 on Thursday the 30th of September. Um, alongside uh, ministers and other MLAs. And uh, this will occur during the regular committee meeting. And if members are content, the meeting can suspend for a short time to allow members to avail of the invitation to view the bus. So if you're okay with that there. Um, also, there is correspondence from the department at page 103 on the Environment Bill, supplementary LCM. And members will recall um, that this was considered at the meeting last week when it was noted. The Department has now formally laid the papers with the Assembly Business Office and there will be a debate scheduled in the Chamber uh, this Monday, the 20, uh, Monday, 20th of mm -hmm. September. And um, are members content to be action uh, the rest of the correspondence as suggested in the index, page at page, index sheet at page 55? Yes? Yeah, we know it there. That's okay. Um, okay. Um, the Forward work program, item number nine, uh, it's at page 913. Can I seek agreement for the forward work program? Okay. 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 Okay, so that's that's matters eight and nine completed. Uh, do we have our elder representatives with us yet? Um? Chair, I've just been advised that they are logging on presently, so um, uh, given that we have no other items of business, just to go to Street immediately. We may wish to suspend for a couple of minutes um, until they officially join. Yeah, okay, sure. We will just suspend for a couple of minutes until the officials join us. Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room 30. This is the... Okay, members, um, welcome uh, back here to the, the meeting. Um, we are at um, item, <coughs> pardon me, Item number five, uh, it's the climate, uh, climate change bill, uh, number one bill, and uh, we have oral evidence from the Northern Ireland Local Government Association, NILGA. Reading paper from NILGA is... Yeah. Um, okay. 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 The briefing paper in Pranilga is at page 21. Okay, and can I welcome by Starleaf, Karen Smith, Head of Policy and Governance, and Councillor Robert, Robert Burgess, the Nilga President. Morning, Karen and Councillor Burgess. Good morning, Chair. Um, uh, Councillor Burgess is, is for joining us from home, Chair, and uh, I think he's just had a, a few uh, broadband issues, so I'm hoping he'd be with us fairly soon. Mm -hmm. But possibly, maybe if if I um, can just uh, kick off uh, rather than holding the committee back by um, just uh, run through uh, what the what the introductory comments that Robert was going to give, and um, would that would that be? Yeah, th that would be very <laughs> helpful, Karen. And then uh, uh, and then sure, Councillor um, Burgess perhaps can join us, and then we'll be able to ask some questions of you after your presentation. So thank you, Karen. Yes, work away. So apologies for that. Um, Chair, members, thank you for the opportunity to meet with you this morning on the vital piece of work that is the development of climate legislation for Northern Ireland. Um, there's no doubt that climate change is the defining issue of our time and that our children, grandchildren and those to follow will not thank us for our inaction. The UK is clearly not ready to face the challenges of climate change, with the Northern Ireland even less so. Local legislation is absolutely necessary and we are keen to ensure that an agreed act is successfully passed before the end of the current assembly mandate, bearing in mind the current discussions. To fail in this regard would be unforgivable. We are already locked in to an undesirable level of climate change. I will be attending the COP26 conference in November with um, Councillor Burgess and we would rather not be in a position where we are advocating action to international colleagues on a do-as-I-say-not-as-I-do basis. Uh, we want to be able to attend on a basis of integrity with a clear direction for Northern Ireland and robust legislation on the way. And I see, Chair, that um, Councillor Burgess has just joined us. Um, so, Councillor Burgess, do you want to um, pick up from the last paragraph on the, on your, uh, your, of the first page of your brief in there? Uh, over the last number of days, is that where we are? Over the, over the last, last number of years? Yeah. Okay, thanks for that, Karen. Sorry if it, uh, Chair, for getting logged in, logged out there two or three times before I got going. So, over the last number of years, NILGA has been developing a position on the climate policy, and particularly detailed discussions have taken place uh, since January this year. Our councils 
are all active in developing and implementing climate action plans, which to date have already been focused on the adoption and are keen that Northern Ireland secures a firm policy footing for the action on mitigation. We are obviously have uh, two alternative pieces of draft legislation in the pipeline, neither of which is are perfect, and we trust that the committee will consider how to ensure the best legislation for Northern Ireland it is crafted from its work on both of these pieces. In relation to the bill currently under consideration, I would like to take the opportunity in highlighting a number of key issues without sticking rigidly to, to the clauses. Nilga strongly supports the declaration of a climate emergency and our councils have found uh, once such declaration has been made, it is vital to ensure effective actions are put in place to mitigate and adopt the strategic priorities. Uh, it is extremely difficult to do this in the absence of legislative direction and appropriate accompanying resources. Nilga strongly supports the production of the Climate Action Plan of the Northern Ireland and the leadership role to the Assembly for its production. We also strongly support the timeline proposed for the production of the first and the subsequent plan. However, we have significant concerns in relation to the proposed 2045 date for achieving net zero and the impact of requirement to reach net zero by that date. The concerns are for two main reasons. There is a lack of clarity on the resources that will be made available to achieve the targets or even how much will be necessary. Nilga is deeply worried that a rapid transition to net zero could leave a large number of people destitute, particularly in rural areas. We are already seeing the start of transition, for example, in the draft peatland strategy, which could result in job losses. Uh, next year of hundreds of people uh, employed in the commercial peat extraction without a clear plan for financial support or retraining. Although we know that there will be a need for a just transition globally, we must also be aware of how to, how to affect the just transition locally. And we see little evidence of much government thinking on this as yet. There's a lack of clarity as to whether uh, this target is even achievable. And the information received by DERA from the UK CCC would indicate that Northern Ireland is likely to be heavily reliant on the rest of the UK to meet national net zero targets by 2050, not 2045. The combined impact of these two points may be that the people of Northern Ireland, including those working in key sectors, begin climate action negatively, and sometimes they cannot achieve, therefore not bother trying. It is unclear from the bill how this kind of untended consequences could be addressed. A significant uh, minority of the people of, of the members keen to agree to the target net zero by 2045. The majority of NILGA members involved in the discussions were supportive of the targets outlined by the UK CCC as achievable, at least 82% uh, reduction on the 1980 targets by 2050. Those words at least are incredibly important and we hope that once the local community and relevant sectors begin to make inroads into the decarbonisation, this target can be tightened. We certainly would not support any relaxation of the targets nor lengthening of the timeline. Nilga welcomes the, the consent of the climate action plans, the focused areas for annual targets, particularly in link to biodiversity of the proposed measures in relation to carbon and nitrogen budgets and the sectoral plan. We support the identification of the key sectors within the legislation as it is properly taken account of the uh, importance of these sectors in achieving the overriding climate objectives. We particularly welcome the proposals including, included in Clause 3, Part 8, in light of the comments on the needs for a just transition, but focus efforts will be required to ensure that the part of Clause 3 can be adequately resourced. There is no doubt that Northern Ireland government and councils will need to change how we, are, how we source funding 
and resources to achieve the necessary changes, particularly in the light of the massive historic and ongoing underinvestment there has been in infrastructure and the grid capacity and in energy infrastructure and in water and wastewater infrastructure and in transport and in EV infrastructure, all of which is compounded by the retentiveness of people in Northern Ireland to accept innovative technologies and the limitations of government to keep up with the pace of change. Nelga is broadly supportive of the proposals to establish an independent climate officer and appoint a climate commissioner, but would be helpful to see proper costings for this, particularly an overall budget for the commissioner staff and operational costs. Although we are supportive of flexibility containing within clause 11, it is currently unclear how sectors that may be on track to not meet their targets would be approached beyond public reporting by the commissioner. How are the, how are the executive office to address the failures? It is also unclear how public bodies are to be Im Im impacted or held accountable by the bill. Councils are keen to take the leadership position and indeed have been despite the ongoing lack of legislation and resources. We are keen to ensure that local government as a part of the co-design proportionate reporting and accountability mechanism going forward to ensure the mistakes of the past are not repeated. We would welcome a collaborative approach to deliver which will require the four F's framework, finance, flexibility and facilitation and to look forward to working with the committee departments and other partners to continue the development and implementation of the climate legislation that Northern Ireland so badly needs. Thank you, Chair, and I want again, Chair, sorry for being late to log on there. Well, thank you, Chair Burgess. Um, uh, Karen, do you want to pick up there? That the, that, that, that's a, the presentation, yeah? Um, Chair, that, that's just our introductory yeah. comments, and yeah. I mean, it's usually with these these things, it's, it's uh, preferable to open things up for discussion and have an interactive uh, conversation about the issues. Yeah, that's perfect. So, are you okay for questions or anything, uh, Councillor Burgess? Oh. And Karen? Yeah, yeah, and if I can't address them, hopefully Karen will be able to help me out there. So. <laughs> no problem at all. Um, do you see? Uh, just re 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 um, in your in your presentation, your 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 written presentation referred to an independent body on energy and climate change. Could you um, elaborate on your thinking around that there? Uh, Karen, do you want to go into discussion of that, yeah? Yeah. Uh, in, in relation to um, like an advisory um, body, yeah, are you yeah. talking about here or? I, I, the independent body on energy and climate change. That was, uh, um, th I think that I read that in your, in your uh, present in your written presentation. Yeah, uh, certainly. I think there was a bit of discussion about whether um, uh, we needed to move to a department for energy and climate change, yeah. and. Um, that we, we had uh, we have concerns about that because what we have seen is that whenever there has been a, a restructuring of government departments, at least a delay and sort of like a naval gazing point in time, um, and also um, with concerns that um, particularly if um, the fun some functions go across to the executive office, mm -hmm. um, they may not have the, the knowledge and understanding of of, um, of what they need to have to um, particularly um, uh, keep departments accountable. Um, in relation to an independent body, um, we were um, certainly um, we're not um, not there's not a lack of support for a climate office and climate commissioner, um, but I suppose that, that as, as Robert articulated in the um, his introductory comments, um, we would be wanting to sort of bottom out the costs of that and um, to make sure that it's not sort of uh, doesn't spiral um, uh, too much away. From, from what we can afford as a, as a, a region. Um, and part of what we were looking at was um, the potential for um, that the role of that climate commission, uh, the climate office, to also be um, the pro provider of independent advice um, and um, to, um, I suppose, um, extend um, the advice that's already available in Northern Ireland, for example, through the, the uh, like of Climate Northern Ireland, um, which has been invaluable. Uh, to councils and um, providing advice and and support um, on adaptation and without without whom we would we would not be anywhere near where we are, um, the and sort of 
I suppose what we were looking at as well, um, and I mean we've, we're about to send you our, our written evidence in relation to Climate Bill Number Two, um, and the suggestion there that there's a heavy reliance on the UK Climate Change Committee, and that may be um, the, the independent body that the, the committee decide is the, the relevant uh, body to provide that that advice. Um, but it's certainly that that independence would be helpful. Um, also, um, we're as, as Robert articulated, we're, we're concerned about enforcement's maybe not the wrong word, but how, how do we hold people accountable for the requirements within the bill? Um, how, do, how do we make sure that the actions are taken, um, that need to be taken? Because if, you know, if there's no comeback, if there's no um, kind of uh, way of holding people to account, then we're not going to be terribly much further on. And tell me, see in terms of... Um the uh, the you know, would you anticipate that there be an additional resource requirement for local governments to you know like facilitate um, reporting on climate change mitigation and adaptation? I, I think, um, Chair, the, the, the main um, resource that will be needed in local government is to actually um, enable the councils to uh, fully uh, put in place climate action plans locally. Um, to make sure that local people are um, aware of, of um, what the mitigation aspects are, are, that, are, that are required are, and also uh, to make sure that they have an understanding of um, the adaptation requirements locally too. I mean, we, we know that in, in other um, jurisdictions and internationally, uh, where local governments have been active in climate action, um, that there has been more progress made, um, and that certainly that is the, the attack we're taking to um, COP26 in November uh, to really um, ask the UK government to support local government to help deliver and to, to deliver locally um, on the objectives uh, on, on climate change because it's 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 one thing. Um, setting a target nationally or regionally, but actually de delivering that requires local local action and local commitment. And councils cannot do that without appropriate resources. Um, so there's that, and also um, you know to to I suppose the, the experience that we've had um, through particularly um, the sustainable development duty that came in in what 2006 is that councils are really prepared and, and des desiring of reporting on the good work that we're doing because it's largely it, the good work that we do is, is often hidden because it's not you know, reported necessarily in the news um, so we want to report on the actions that we're taking and we were providing um, the uh, OFMDFM um, department as, as it was at the time with huge amounts of information on council action um, that was not um, capable of being dealt with by that department so there, there's a conversation that's needed to happen about what the gov what government what will want from councils in relation to reporting what the impact of that reporting is given that the smaller nature of councils here and the, we don't have social housing we don't have um uh, public transport we don't have transport planning there's a lot of things that are sort of included in council reporting and council actions across the water and actually in the south as well that aren't relevant here. So what we don't want is a too heavy handed approach in relation to reporting. We're happy to report, um, but it's just to, to, to make sure that we've actually got the resources to do what we need to do as councils, uh, which we don't necessarily have at the moment. Thank yeah, you. Chair, just to follow on from Karen there, uh, like, uh, finance is going to be the most important thing. Chair, no matter, no matter what happens uh, uh, in, in any business or any sector belonging to it, including councils, is the finance. And we need the help and support from government to get to achieve the goals that set out. Thanks, Chair. Thank okay. um, I'm going to move around the room here. I have a number of speakers. Uh, the first one is Harry. Okay. Thank you very much, Chair. I hope you're back down to earth again after your excitement at the weekend. <laughs> and welcome, welcome, Robert Burgess. Here today, um, Robert, I think you're now chairman of NILCA, is not right, Robert? That's uh, so our president okay. now, Chair. President, sorry, president, there you go. And Karen as well, in regards to Derek McCallum also. A few questions here for you, and if um, any of you have the answers in front of you, happy for you to get back to committee ourselves whenever it suits, okay? It's okay, okay. Yeah. very well. You said in your report, um, your initial comments, Several comment or several councils um, have declared a climate emergency. I'm just wondering, can you tell us um, 
and which councillors have declared a claim of emergency and which haven't, and if any reason why. And again, as I say, if you haven't that result, Karen, I'm happy for you to come back to us. But I was just wondering you know, why some think it's more important than others. Okay. I think, um, Chair, through you, um, they, I, I would be reluctant to give a list um, at just at this moment in time, Mr Harvey, because it, it, it changes over time and I'm not sure that what the information I've got is up to date. Certainly, there are more some councils that are more active in relation to climate um, action yeah. than others, and that they tend to be the councils that have managed to access funding from elsewhere. Um, so what we're finding is that, for example, Derry City and Strabane District Council are very much a sectoral leader on this. They're providing um, information that the other councils are able to use, but, they've, but they have utilised funding from, the, I think it was the Interreg programme, to staff up and to be able to provide that. Um, um, Belfast City Council have, uh, now this is maybe taken away from your, the climate emergency piece pure, but um, Belfast City Council have used, I suppose, their work through the Resilient Cities uh, programme to develop a resilience um, strategy, which is really kind of developed then into their climate um, action and that they have sort of um, developed a number of, of local policies and strategies around that. What we're finding is that there's a large number of councils who are trying to do climate action, trying to even just do the adaptation stuff to make sure that their people are protected um, in relation to severe weather events. And they're doing that using um, staff they've already got as a, a sort of a bolt on to their, their already very, very busy workload. Um, so it's not necessarily, um, being, we're not able to give um, climate action the attention it deserves and we, we're in a situation now where our members have actually at the last NILGA meeting have asked me to get um, a sort of um, ready reckoner as to where different councils are in relation to council action so actually you're, you're asking me something I've already been asked by our own members so that's definitely something I can, I can get you in for a fairly quick time. Yeah that's okay and um, you said um, also in your report that quick wins are, are achieved through improved local government waste management and renewable energy, energy developments. These are actually very substantial gains and I would commend our local councils for the management of the both on renewables and recycling. I know Yuri Morton Down working with Regen are doing an excellent job and I think these are to be acknowledged so I would commend the councils for doing that. Do you know of any future plans for recycling? I mean, whenever, just to say that, I was looking through and you talked about reducing methane. Um, what I think is great is diverting methane into use as a biofuel. Is this something you would be encouraging? Um, certainly, uh, Chair, through you, that's something that the councils are very actively involved in. Um, we're in the process now. We're, we've, we've got, we've achieved pretty much our targets um, that were, were in place to, to go to um, 50% uh, diversion from, from landfill. And I think that we're moving now towards, I suppose, a more circular economy approach. We're working very closely with uh, DERA and also Department for Economy and SIB, Strategic Investment Board, um, to um, input into the developing um, circular economy strategic framework. Um, and th that is all. It's about uh, we're moving to 65% tar targets, sort of. So, so it's another 15% that we have mm -hmm. to achieve, um, and uh, within the next sort of 10 years or so. And I think that um, the councils are aware of um, the opportunities that are available in renewables. Um, we are aware of the limitations of the grid, which councils have no control over, um, and we are aware of the. Um, I suppose, as, as Robert touched on, the reticence of local people um, mm -hmm. to have certain developments beside them um, and, 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 and sort of concerns about uh, their house prices or their house values or whatever and, and maybe um, concerns about possible smells or just um, if there's a lack of understanding and knowledge of certain technologies um, and if, if there's also um, maybe there's a novel or innovative technology there's, there's a reticence there that we need to get past and, and actually embrace and, and sort of have um, Northern Ireland as a leader in new technology, I mean, as we've seen in, with hydrogen and, and hydrogen production. So, you know, that there's there's opportunities there. We would li like to see people embrace, but we're aware of where the the, um, the limitations are, and we'll, we're willing as councils to work with local people and um, our assembly colleagues um, to overcome those. Yeah. Excellent answers, thank you. Thank you. Um, um, Wales and the Republic of Ireland, our closest neighbour, are currently examining their existing targets to ensure they reach as close as possible to net zero by 2050. And you mentioned our concerns are that for 2045, a timeline that could have an impact on our society. 
I'm just wondering what impact you think that would cut that could have on society. So, certainly, Chair. I think um, Councillor Burgess would be um, very keen to to have a, uh, to address the committee about the uh, impact it could have on the rural community, particularly in yeah. the farm uh, yes. community. Maybe That's Robert, do you want to? Be Come in on that? Yeah, well, uh, just just to follow you in there, Harry, it, it, it takes a wee bit longer to, to, to get agricultural turned around, especially in that sector, uh, where there's a, a breeding, uh, we need to breed a, a different type of animal than we have today, we, we need time to change our crops, we need time to change the soil structure to grow those crops, like that's where we need the extra five years there to, yep. to allow all that to turn around. But Harry, back, back, back to councils there, as we were at, at the very start. There were a couple of councils that, that were able to, to get a head start there, had really different types of funds in place that they could use that, utilise that money. But all our councils at the minute are stretched as far as they can go. So maybe, maybe if the committee uh, could help the finance minister, maybe find some money to help councils achieve these goals. Uh, and, and a quick fix at the start, at least to, take it to, to get the groundwork done. I'd yeah. very much appreciate it if there's something that you could do on behalf of us there, Harry. That would be appreciated. Absolutely. But agriculture, uh, you know, and, and the rural area, and then the peat production, as, as it was said there, there's a lot of jobs going to be lost, and it's just not the agriculture jobs, it's really the jobs in, in the food industry, especially uh, with, 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 with the manufacturing of food. Like, if it's not going to be there, they're not going to manufacture in this country, so you, you lost a lot of those jobs. There's 120,000 people involved in those jobs. Mm -hmm. So we really do need to get our act together and, 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 and get the finance in place to help and support that change. Yep. And just to finish, you did say that um, your members voted in favour of 82% reduction um, by 2050, as recommended by the CCC. So, yep, that's great. Thank you very much, President Burgess and Karen. Um, appreciate it. And thank you, Chair. That's me. Thank you. Thanks for uh, question. All right. Thank you. Uh, Patsy? Patsy Malone. Yeah. Uh, are we on air there, Chair? Thanks very much yeah. indeed. And uh, good good to see you there. Uh, sorry, my phone was calling in the background there. Good to see you, uh, Councillor Burgess, and congratulations on yeah. your, your elevation to presidency there. Um, Thanks, Patsy. And, and also, uh, Karen, too, good to see you as well again. It's been a while since uh, I served on Nilga, but, but anyway, we're still here and still starting. So, uh, just, Karen, I just wanted to explore some of the commentary that uh, you were saying there about uh, how important it is to hold people to account. And also, sorry, hit the same button there. That's, um, how, it is, how important it is to hold people to account. And and so far as I see that, um, I would say that that's where the role of the commissioner comes in, in terms of a, a regional strategy of holding people to account. Mm -hmm. Now, um, but by by virtue of what you said, and I've just followed through the logic of what you said from what I heard, um, that would by necessity mean or could mean more powers for the office of commissioner, and inevitably, if there's more powers needed and a range of um, investigation and oversight and supervision of how government bodies or, or other agencies, arm's length agencies, are performing in terms of their delivery, whether that's local or regional government, then that inevitably means more resources or adequate resources for the Commissioner's Office. So um, can, can you just talk me through a position where I was hearing that Nilga might have uh, difficulties with uh, resources going to commissioner's office and how that rests easily with your correct demands that there should be oversight and supervision to ensure adequate standards of uh, compliance with uh, whatever rollout of climate change legislation there is. Um, Chair, uh, through you, I, I think, um, Mr. McLoom, it's um, that's very fat formal, Patsy. <laughs> I've known you too long to cut you, Mr. McLoom. Yeah, um, cool. Go ahead, everybody else does. Uh, I, th I think that um, you know there there is a, an issue, and that we need to really bottom out what it, what you, we need from the climate commissioner. If climate commissioner is put in place, what does that climate commissioner need to do, and does it go as far yeah. as enforcement or that that kind of accountability um, the, the the responsibility um, aspect? Um, because really, f my reading of this is that you know yes, um, there will be annual reports on progress laid, and certainly. Um, I would have imagined that the government departments who are working with the sectors will be um, 
embarrassed if there isn't enough progress. But then, you know, what what happens if there isn't enough progress? You know, where where is the comeback? Um, and yeah. if resources are needed with the, within that commissioner's office to do that, it, it's about how, what the form following function is about that scope and that yes. right, making it clear. And at the minute. It's a kind of open-ended thing. It, it's it's not clear as to you know the, the talk about it, um, a staff and an office for the climate commissioner, um, but yes. what does that look like? How many people? What are they be doing? What are the functions? You know, and it, it, that that level of clarity. It may not be um, something that can be put in a piece of legislation, but it's something that de very definitely needs to be thought about. And it's part of that wider financial conversation. And we're aware in Nilga that it's highly unlikely that enough money is going to be made available by government to. Um, do the climate action that we need. Um, so where does the other money come from? How, can we have intelligent conversations with um, the finance sector, with the banks, with green investment companies? Um, how do we work differently? How do we restructure our, uh, particularly in local government, uh, and our recent experience of, of the COVID crisis, is how do we restructure how we're funded um, to be more sustainable um, and to sort of work differently to face the challenges that we face, because at the minute, I think we're really ill prepared to do that. And part of that is the holding people to account piece and um, with that climate commissioner. Well, office. Just if I could move it on and I just I'm, I'm picking up where you're coming from, but it, it takes me to the inevitable question. And that is, um, while this bill doesn't champion this and advocate this, um, is Nilga saying that the commissioner's office should have more powers, more oversight and intervention powers in terms of circumstances where government departments, arm lengths or public agencies aren't meeting the benchmark as set by, by the Commissioner's Office and by regional government? I think that, um, Chair, through you, I think that the uh, position in Northern Ireland at, as, at the moment, I think it's fairly well acknowledged that um, regulation of environmental um, legislation is not in a great place. Um, this is another piece of environmental legislation I'm looking to see, right, how is this going to be regulated? Because I, I don't think that um, NIEA, for example, are in the right place to, to do that. They're not mm -hmm. resourced to do that. Um, we've obviously got um, the, the oversight mechanism now coming in with the Office of Environmental Protection, but that's a different, that's a different level of, 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 of pay. Yeah. Of the pay. So we, we need to look at, right, well, you know, it's, it's, all, it's just all very well putting these things in place and saying that we need to do X, Y, and Z, but, you know, if it doesn't happen, what happens? You know, if we because people people will want um, yes, which brings yeah. which which brings me back to that no part of the question is the power that the um, the environmental commissioner's office or the oversight commissioner's office will have to do things to make sure that all the things are done by way of either um, prohibitive measures or indeed fines or that type of range of measures or facilities that are available to the Commissioner's Office to ensure that there is compliance uh, within reason at, at various levels within the public sector. So um, is that where, is that the place where, I'm just listening to what you're saying, is that the place where you're saying there is or there should be an enhanced sort of functional role for the Commissioner's Office? From experience in the past now, that my, the, the climate number two bill has given me cause for thought on this, um, Patsy, I have to say, because the, the experience that I've had in the past is that I've been very much led to believe that it's very difficult for one government department to hold another government department yes. because of our mandatory coalition structure. Um, so you, perhaps there needs to be a level above that that holds everybody to account, you know? Yes. Um, and, uh, you know, it'll be for the committee, it'll be for the assembly to decide what that looks like. Uh, but I would say that it's it's ne it's a necessary consideration. It's not something that I don't I don't think it's something that uh, Nilga would be particularly opposed to. Um, but it's just that clarity is what we're seeking more than anything at the okay. moment. Because it's just at the moment that it's not really clear in this bill. Okay, right. That's grand. Thank you very much, um, Robert and Karen. There, and good to see you again. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks for that. Okay, Ro Rosemary. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, can I welcome Robert and Karen? It's good to see both of you again, too. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Uh, my question sort of fo follows on from what Patsy was asking. In Clause 9, in your written statement, you talk about the possible additional functions for climate opera. What do you see those as being? Um, Chair, through you, and I've got I've got the response in front of me now. And I think this is maybe what Chair, what you were touching on earlier on as well. I, I mean, it, it's 
in relation to the independent advice um, aspect of, of the Climate Office, um, we're aware that um, the, the situation in Northern Ireland is very different from um, the, the situation in, for example, England. Um, we're, we're much more heavily reliant on agriculture. There's, um, you know, there, there are things here that we would maybe want to have local advice on that, you know, it, it's, I think people uh, in Northern Ireland value having advice that is local as well as, as advice from across the water so that we can develop how we go forward ourselves based on the advice that UKCCC and IPCC give us, but actually developing a, a, a locally appropriate solution. And it's maybe, um, Mrs Barton, that um, we are uh, for, coming from local government, we're very uh, keen to make sure that local solutions are applied to things, you know, so it, 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 it's coming from that um, thinking. Um, certainly, we have been um, actively involved at working with Climate Northern Ireland and um, Sustainable Northern Ireland and SOLAS in providing a local government um, addendum to the Northern Ireland um, climate ad uh, adaptation um, plan and, and the, the sort of it was complementary to the last NICAP report. Um, and we have been um, sort of operating in the, in the advice that has been provided by Climate Northern Ireland. So, you know, I would be keen to see they, they, they have been limited um, to a certain extent in their function because they have been really focused on adaptation and resilience, which is absolutely necessary. Um, but something along those lines for mitigation would be really, really helpful. And it has, they have, as I said to you, I can't um, sort of um, express how helpful it's been to councils in getting um, our, our activity off the ground. And they have, they also, they bring in um, membership on their steering group from other se sectors. So they have, there's, there's uh, membership from the agri-food industry, from the insurance industry, from um, business in the community, from, you know, there's a, a whole range of sectors and government departments and local government all working together to look at what um, advice is necessary in Northern Ireland on the climate adaptation. So something like that in, in relation to mitigation and widening that, that uh, advice site would be really helpful locally just to have somebody can ring up sort of phone a friend rather than trying to get through to somebody in london um on something you know uh -huh. so you would would you see them then as fulfilling a function for example where the public could phone them up and say we're concerned about this or we need support or help in relation to different different issues of environmental concern um, certainly um, at the moment, for, I'll give you an example. Um, we're in the, pr the process of working with um, Climate Northern Ireland and the Regional um, Emergency Preparedness Group um, to develop an, a, a, an event in the second week of the COP26 um, conference, local, a local event for the an, an, what we're calling an adaptation day um, to um, highlight to the local people what the risks are to them of, of climate change. So people, for example, in the Belfast area may not be aware that their, their house is potential for flooding in a number of years time, unless we get this right. Um, so we're hoping to have a resilience roadshow to um, support the public in um, developing how they approach the risks to their home and to their, their person um, from climate change. And we've been active um, through Climate Northern Ireland and through that resilience group in um, providing um, early warning systems, for example, in, in rivers um, to warn people when flooding might be happening. So that there is there is engagement with the public in relation to adaptation, because that's where mm -hmm. we've had the freedom and the permission um, from departments to um, become active. And what we're, we're hoping to do is to prevent flooding rather than have to give a thousand pound to every house that's being flooded. We don't want the houses to be flooded in the first place. So that's in relation to adaptation. We want to have that same conversation in relation to mitigation to make sure that people have information about how they can um, reduce their carbon um, usage and, and how, how can they can move as individuals and families towards a zero carbon lifestyle. Okay. Thank you. And um, just one other uh, one other question before I go. You you speak in your you speak in your written uh, submission also about clear sectoral targets should be set to deter any allowance grabbing of carbon budgets. Can you explain what you mean allowance grabbing of carbon budgets? Um, I think um, th th what that alludes to is that um, if a regional carbon budget is set, um, it may be that um, one sector 
may be having more of a challenge than another and may um, have targets that if it's if it's not rigid, if it's not sort of a fixed target, they may be able to work within that regional um, carbon budget to um, work more slowly than we maybe we would prefer we would like like them to. So it's just to make sure that there's a clarity for the sectors involved as to what's expected of them um, and what um, where the flex where the flexibility might be. And it may be that the government decides or the climate commissioner decides that you know because of whatever circumstance a bit of flexibility is necessary, but it is just to make sure that we try to make things clear for people and, and yeah. work on priorities that are that are set there. Yeah, so you would see perhaps agricultural working at a slower rate than uh, infrastructure or something or something like that. Uh, well, I wouldn't want to. Society. I wouldn't want to identify a sector as, as a, you know sort of uh, working more slowly. I, I think um, that I mean certainly the conversations I've had with um, members of the uh, the farming community would indicate to me that actually people are really starting to move there yeah. um, and want to do stuff. It's but I, I, I do think that if a particular challenges surface that we need to, there needs to be some flexibility but it's just to make sure that people are clear and what's expected of them yeah no i sorry i shouldn't have used you working more slowly that some sectors find it a greater challenge to reach uh, to reach the carbon neutral level thank you very much indeed thank you Rosemary, Rosemary, can i just come in there in the back of agriculture one day you asked there yes the, the farming community has already started there's a lot of discussion around right, uh, how, how we're going to change but there's a lot of young farmers have already been home over the last few years we were told to go for growth there's a lot of young farmers and, and their farm families have spent a lot of money to, to, to push forward they were advised by dira to, to, to go down that road to produce more food so it's going to take a bit of extra time to get that done but there's other farmers who equally are, are coming near the end of their working career and uh, maybe uh, if they got a bit of help and support, maybe a retirement scheme could come in that could help to speed the agriculture industry up till changing. So maybe all those should be taken on board uh, to allow these changes to take place. And maybe we could get more trees planted and one or two other things we could do in, in the peat bogs and, and allow all our parts of farmland to be used for those who wish to continue on. So there's a whole new change, a whole new thought that needs to be brought up. And it's only through your committee that these can take place. So it's back down to what I told Harry a few months ago there. It's really getting finance in place to help and support the agriculture industry to allow that to happen. Okay. So, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to move across to John. John Blair. Chair, uh, thank you. Can I thank uh, Karen and Councillor Burgess as well for their, their presentation, their answers this morning. Wish Councillor Burgess, of course, uh, all the very best in his term as President of NILGA. I, um, Chair, I had some questions around some of the broad brush issues which have, which have been generally dealt with. So I'm going to go into some specifics about coordination of actions and um, tying together action plans across three main areas. Um, Karen will have heard me before on coordination of, of uh, plans across local government, uh, as have colleagues on this committee. So if I could start with waste management, for example, Karen, um, has there been a discussion at NILGA or, or does NILGA have a view on the effectiveness of having separate waste management structures uh, to, to deal with waste management across Northern Ireland? Uh, for example, I understand the, the uh, focus on the success of meeting our targets, but I'm not quite sure there's the same concentration on maximising potential. Um, and uh, the, the question directly is, is the fractured waste management structure across Northern Ireland a help or a hindrance? And are there any plans to lobby for a more joined up, coordinated approach to recycling across the country? I'll cite the example once again. We have different systems of recycling within single council areas, let alone across different council areas and that therefore has to have a pretty major impact on recycling outcomes. Uh, Chair, through you, um, I'd like to reassure uh, Mr Blair that we are actively involved in um, trying to bring about a more um, collaborative approach to waste management within local government in Northern Ireland. I have been working for quite some time as a secretariat for a group called the Northern Ireland Strategic Waste Partnership. And um, that is bringing together senior civil servants and C uh, chief executives of councils, as well as technical experts from local government and from um, the, the from DERA mainly, um, to 
look at um, how to have a, a more um, collaborative and a strategic approach to uh, the delivery on municipal waste in Northern Ireland. Now, that has um, involved a development of a, a, an impl a central local implementation plan um, and it includes um, issues of governance, um, which is really what you're, you're talking about. Um, we have got a group that, um, of uh, the heads of service and directors of uh, the waste management or technical services in all of the councils working together to um, deliver, um, we're hoping to get an 11 council waste management plan off the ground. Now, it may be that it ends up in two separate plans because of the uh, continuing uncertainty over uh, um, R21 uh, project, which I think you may be meeting with, with R21 and later on this morning. Um, and um, we're, we're doing our best to get an 11 council plan operational. Um, we also are trying to get an 11 council um, governance arrangement off the ground and um, a strategic investment board are actually in the process of doing an economic appraisal for the councils on how that works. So it's actually fairly far advanced, John. Um, so um, certainly I have a, a great deal of confidence that something will surface on this in, in the not too distant future. Um, I was hoping that um, the councils will all be provided with a paper um, to consider um, in the autumn. Um, and so I was hoping to have some sort of decision on this by the end of the year. Now, there are considerations that need to be taken into account. We've got a very small region. We have got a very tight, um, uh, which is, is, is to their, um, I suppose we need to just praise them for that, for the, in relation to the, um, the waste management industry. Um, they're very focused on what, on what they provide and what they can work with councils to provide. Um, we need to uh, make sure that whatever changes that we put in place have an adequate lead-in time um, so that we're not um, falling foul of a contracting legislation. And that's where, because the, the councils have had all individual contracts um, on different things, we, we need to just sort of try to get across that. And that has been a particularly difficult issue. Um, we, one of the, the key things that's coming up in the next while is actually how do we deal with the, a, a landfill ban? How do we improve our landfill diversion? Um, and you know, if we don't have um, certain infrastructure, and um, it, it's a political decision about whether we have that infrastructure or not, then what? Then what do we do? Are we are we satisfied with with exporting waste, which is um, it's, it's actually people's livelihoods there, and in, in relation to to that, and I'm aware of that. Um, so, but it's about how what the policy decisions are required for Northern Ireland. Now we're we're having a, a discussion about um, how to take this all forward, and a lot of it is going to be down to. And political decisions about what um, is permissible and what's not. Okay, Karen, that, that's a very, very helpful answer. On, on a similar theme, um, as far as r reduction in vehicle use is concerned and improving our um, active travel infrastructure, uh, greenways, blueways, and, and all associated matters, um, is there any plan to coordinate action across councils on that? Because for obvious reasons, uh, my, my own council area, Andrew Newton Abbey, for example, immediately abutting Mitten East Andrew, Mid Ulster and, and Lisburn and Castlereagh, um, there would be greenway walkway opportunities there that would straddle the, the, the council areas. And I'm keen to know what discussion of any has taken place around trying to bring together a coordinate, back to coordination, coordinated plan. And if that competition hasn't taken place, is there a plan to have that in the future? Um, Chair, through you, I would need to go into detail with that on the, the, the officers who are responsible for those. I mean, I know that there is a lot of collaborative working on um, on issues that are related to um, mitigation and, and sort of um, reduction of carbon. Um, there has I mean there have been a number of um, key um, aspects of, of uh, greenway infrastructure that we put in place that are collaborative projects. I mean, certainly the, the Cumber Greenway, the Conswater Greenway, yeah, yeah. Um, they're all collaborative and it's not just the councils that are involved in those um, we have obviously got um, a lot of, of, of green blue infrastructure plan in Derry City and Straban and they are, are, are also very active in developing their natural capital approach which is really good to see as a, a, a game they're trailblazing um, for councils in this area um, I think that you know bearing in mind that we have got a number of councils working with government departments on things like peatland restoration um, that is really significant um, and globally significant actually in Northern Ireland. Yeah. Um, I, I would anticipate that there will be um, collaborative working on, on greenways and blueways because of, as you say, they, they, don't, they will cross boundaries and we need to make sure they join up. I mean, certainly um, there has been a new uh, what, uh, 
Greenway in, in, in Lisburn that I would imagine sort of follows on with the, the sort of greenways that are going into Belfast as well because we have to support people who are commuting from you know particularly outside the Belfast area to which is your own your own area and um, sort of in sort of from Andrew Newton Abbey into into Belfast so um they need to talk with, with each other about that and sort of uh, make sure plans see each other and, and there is actually um a statutory requirement for councils to work together on community planning and and, and uh, development plans as well um, to make sure that they see each other so that kind of infrastructure bit I think is, is something that's in hand maybe not through the avenue that might, you might think sort of initially but it might be coming through the planning process for but I can certainly look into that for you and, and see what's what's happening at the moment one of the things I would mention though is that what we're finding is that the funding that's coming from government is coming in a very piecemeal fashion um, and certainly something that we brought up in the uh, in our written submission about needing multi-year funding to have any kind of um, future proofing for our, our infrastructure project um, in relation to um, greenways in particular we're glad to see the money but with a bit coming from DERA with a bit coming from DFI there's a bit coming from well so it's, it's try, trying for, to get the departments to kind of work together collaboratively on this to have a yeah. fund yeah. that they're all contributing to it would be really helpful Kyle, that leads me to another point. I won't turn it into a question. I'm mindful of time here for the chair and other members, and of course yourselves. But um, the same can be said about um, electric vehicle uh, rollout, for example, across councils. And I'm very happy if um, we can be notified in future if there are any barriers around application processes, the practicalities of the charging network and associated problems, um, bearing in mind the challenge of this presents in rural areas in particular. But if we could be kept up to date, any coordination of that local government and any barriers that you're coming across, I would be really, really happy to try and assist through the committee with that. Thank you very much. Again, Ian, that'll be a, a, a discussion with DFI um, yeah, and yeah. a strategic discussion on that. Okay, thank you. Okay, all thank you, it. John. Right, I need to urgently move on because the next witnesses are due with us in two minutes and I have two speakers. Um, w William? Thank you. Can you hear me okay? Yes, yes William. Yes, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah. Okay, can I thank Robert and Karen for their presentation? Cool. And, and I do welcome the fact that Nilga does uh, support the Climate Change Committee's uh, recommendations. Given I take it that given you support the committee, uh, climate change committee's recommendations, uh, you would have concerns with the private members' bill in relation to reaching that zero by uh, 2045. Um, Chair, through you, certainly we've, we've outlined that in our um, both our, our written evidence and the oral evidence that there is that concern, and we've outlined the reasons why, what the concerns are, are, are based on. Um, but what I would emphasise to the member is that we are very much taking the line that it needs to be at least 82%. It's it's not 82% isn't isn't the kind of um, end game, um, and we want it to be. A, it's kind of a, a, a hook to get people involved to ensure that they feel that it's achievable, um, and then we can work towards a, a, a tighter target uh, as time progresses. Um, but I, at the minute, the the priority is getting climate legislation off the ground. We need to get climate legislation in place so that we have at least a direction of travel and we have an ability then to say, well, if you're given this legislation, then what, where's the resources for that? You know, so it's, it's um, I think as well, it, it's a majority view in NILGA. Uh, it'd be unfair of me not to reflect that it was actually um, a quarter of the members that were involved in the meeting and um, where we discuss, discussed that um, target were in, in favour of the uh, tighter target in the private members bill. Um, but certainly the majority um, view was that an at least 82% uh, reduction is where we're, what we're in favour of. I'm sure you would accept that the Climate Change Committee, its recommendations in effect meant that the UK as a whole reached net zero. So we are a food production region, produce a lot of food and export that into the mainland, and probably 80% of our food goes into the mainland. So it would seem fair and reasonable that if we can reach 82% by 2050, that given given that, that means uh, the UK as a whole reaches net zero, uh, it, it, that in my eyes I think should be acceptable and I think uh, the, the NILGA feels the same as I can see it. I think it's very important that many real we have a number of parties on, on our committee we must realise that have sponsored this particular bill. And I think we must face reality 
um, that there's thousands of jobs at stake in this. Uh, we're told that if uh, we go for the private members' bill, the industry themselves are telling us it could mean uh, massive reductions in livestock, which in effect means massive reductions in processing, which in effect means massive lo lo job losses. So I think, I think it's important that we fully realise the consequences of not getting this right. Um, Chair, through you, I think that um, certainly um, Mr Irwin, Irwin makes a, p a very good point, but what I would say to you is regar regardless of the bill that eventually passes, there has going to have to be significant change to the, the farming and agri-food industry if we are going to um, uh, be become more self-sufficient as a region, if we are going to cut down the number of food miles, if we are going to ensure that farming is sustainable and that we're uh, growing crops and, and, and uh, having animal husbandry that is um, appropriate for our changing weather conditions, uh, bearing in mind that you know um, our, our current reliance on grass-fed um, cattle that may have to change considerably. Um, and I mean, obviously, um, uh, Councillor Burgess, you, you're directly engaged in the farming industry, so you'll probably uh, be able to, to, to answer this better than me. But it's just there will need to be significant changes anyway. Um, and it's just how we support the farming industry to work through that transition. We're hoping that there will be um, some kind of arrangement put in place to ease the transition, to have that just transition that we're talking about but it's unclear at the moment where the resources for that would come from, and that is our main concern. Sorry, Robert, do you want to yeah, say anything? Really yeah, well, just, uh, yeah, well, just to follow along there, uh, William has asked a, 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 a question that's going to be very hard to answer, mm -hmm. because there's a lot of young farmers out there who have spent a lot of money. It's back again to the finance of it, and it's going to take a bit of time for them to change, and that's where we need government to help and support those to bring that change about. If, if it really wants it to happen, because that is the only way. And there will be 120,000 jobs at least disappear out, out of it by the time we get to 82%. There is going to be a lot more of all our uh, jobs within the, the, the machinery industry, because all the machines will be, have to change too. There's going to be a, a, a lot of upheaval within agriculture. And William is right, uh, where we start, we have already started, really because we've started in our mind of where we're going and that's why it's important that we get a, a, a retirement scheme in place for the, 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 the farming industry and to allow the other younger farmer to continue on because there's be a bigger reduction and we need to move people out of that industry okay. so when you, it's all when you, to finance when you accept, i'm sure you would accept that to reduce a vast massive reduction in Northern Ireland's agriculture to import from countries that are creating global warming doesn't much, make much sense either, does it? Absolutely not. That is that is the whole key thing. And that's where those agri-related jobs will disappear to other countries that's going to produce the food and send it to us. That's right. Uh, and they're, they're producing much more towards global warming than we are. So it doesn't make much sense at the end of the day. Right? Well, that's the part that we need to sort out. That is really where we need to go. But the world needs to accept there is a change needed, and we really have to change, to be honest. Uh, I don't disagree. But I, I, well, I, I would agree. I think we have to do what we can, but we need to be careful not to do something that totally damages our industries and the other countries look after their industries and import their food to us, and, and uh, we, we be the poor guys. Absolutely, and that's where government right. needs to come in and assist it. Yes, you're right, 100%. Right, thank okay, you. Thank you. Uh, okay, folks, I need to really move on because the next witnesses are waiting. So, uh, Claire. Thank you, Chair, and thank you very much uh, for being with us today. There's been loads of, of issues that you've raised that's given me loads of food for thought, um, but I'm really keen to hear maybe a wee bit more if you've thought about it, I suppose, or if, if it has been a conversation on what you were saying earlier about having an overarching accountability body and, you know, acknowledging the fact that our harsher and institution model is really maybe not adaptable enough or capable in its design about, you know, being able to deliver that, that accountability. Has there been conversations or thoughts about what that would look like? something I would be keen to explore. Um, 
Uh, through you, Chair um, Claire, no, we, ha we haven't um, come up with a suggestion in relation to that. It's just what we did was outline the experience that we've had to date in relation to the, the sustainable development duty and, and how, that was, how that panned out. And I, I suppose that the, it was actually at, at, uh, the responsibility for uh, monitoring and, and reporting sort of bounced around from um, uh, what was DOE to OFM, DFM, they couldn't really cope with it and then it bounced back to DERA again and hasn't been, you know, hadn't been really um, resourced terribly well. Um, and it, it's just that, you know, if we, we don't do um, regulation well, we don't do an enforcement well uh, in Northern Ireland and it, it's, it's to do with um, resources more than anything, I think. Um, but certainly um, we need, if we are going to make a success of whatever bill we end up with, um, we need to make sure that it, that people can be held accountable for for what they're required to do, and whether that's through government departments or whether that's to, directly to sectors, um, it's, it's, uh, that's a political call. Um, it's certainly you know it's not something that we have given a huge amount of thought to, apart from the fact that you know what is the point in um, putting targets in place that people aren't aren't held responsible for? I mean, with for example the, the waste management targets whenever they were first put in place, councils just thought, this is impossible, we can't do this, we can't do this. And actually at the heels of the hunt, we, we ended up um, meeting the target before we needed to. You know, so I mean, these things, whenever people are given a target, they will bust a gut to try to meet them. And we know that, and particularly particularly local government, you know, if we, if we know what we have to achieve, we will work towards achieving it. Now, it, it needed um, changes in approach, it needed um, new things, and uh, we needed to have um, food waste collections and things that, that, that we didn't have before, but we did it. And, you know, and now we're working to a 65% target, so we need to have a think again about you know, how we, we improve that. Um, so, but it's just that but what was always behind that was the threat of EU infraction if we didn't meet that target. So, and it's, uh, that's actually still there because um, COVID put a bit of a spanner in the works in relation to our, our waste management targets and, and, and the last year or so. But um, certainly that, that that kind of enforcement aspect of it, it, it opens people's minds. So if you're going into yeah. a piece of work where you're putting, giving people targets and there's no comeback, then you know it's like, why, why would it bother? You know, there's, there's no point. Yeah. So it's how you do I, that. It, that's a political decision about how you do that. And, and in that mandatory coalition, environment i think that's it's something that needs to be teased out yeah no i couldn't agree more and it's not simply an issue of punitive sanctions i suppose because by setting that target what you have to do is enable the resource in 100 percent you know you can't have one without the other and the, the recycling that you're given there the, those rates mean exactly the same in terms of targets happen with the energy sector as well but i'm really keen to follow that up with it i mean it's been 13 years or more since the uk climate act has been in place and then during that time what we've seen and i think was really interesting was councillor burgess mentioned as well you know at the same time as that was there is own going for growth strategy then that led to, to farmers to produce more produce more produce more leading to northern ireland and being into the very precarious situation that we're in and only leading to 18 percent of the uk's carbon reduction to date um while scotland and wales um are in the 40s or 30 and 40 percent um but see in terms of that just transition principle which i think is really really key to this um, so those principles are built into the the bill, um, and they you know within the the climate action plans would talk about the job creation strategies that need to come forward. So it's this in tandem the the appropriate resourcing with the job creation strategies in order to take advantage of new green systems, whether they be in industry or finance or, or circular economies or community development. So we keep hearing about you know the threat to jobs and the job losses that could be caused you know and it's not this bill that's coming from climate change really you know because it's climate change we, we have no control over unless we begin to mitigate so is there assessment anywhere um about the number of jobs that can be created or the potential for job creation um, I'm not sure, um, Councillor Burgess, have, have you any um, sort of, because I think um, UFU had it oh. done recently. 
Well, I would like to know uh, from Claire, what sort of jobs does she think that, that we could create? Because we have nearly racked our brains thinking what we can do, especially in the agriculture community. Uh, then you have all the jobs uh, with, 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 within the food packaging industry. Where are they going to get their jobs from? And that's what, uh, that's okay. what our questions are, because they're trained for that job. So you're going to have to retrain people who are 40 and 50 years of age because they've been involved in it and made good business and good business decisions in it. And now they're told, just pack your bags and go. So Claire, I'd really like to know from you, what do you see yeah. us doing? I would love to see Nilga maybe do a bit of a research or background paper in terms of where job creations within local councils are. So we have things like, well, we know particularly in rural communities, the levels of fuel poverty. Um, and we know, for example, even quarter 25% uh, of farmers are living in poverty as well. You know, so what is needed in terms of trying to reduce those consumer bills, those household bills, that fuel poverty, people being able to be forced to choose between heat or eat, for example. We know our housing stock is not fit for purpose. We know that our energy infrastructure is not for, for purpose to get proper energy systems out over, you know, into the, the west of, of the province, for example. So there's a huge amount. And we know also that the whole global finance system is moving toward investment in green sector jobs, in green sector thinking, in green sector um, industry so that comes back to what Karen said earlier about we are ill prepared to take advantage of the financial opportunities so if we are ill prepared give us a sense of what you think we could do to help build that preparedness I th and think what is it that Sorry to cut across yet yeah, no I, th I think um, you're, you're right I mean we're, we're very good at identifying the, the problems um, and what we have done, and we certainly, um, Nilga has recently done um, a response to the skills strategy. We've responded to the energy strategy. We've res obviously responded to, to consultations from DERA on, on different aspects of this work. Um, there is a need to scale up. We need to develop um, a, a quantity of people um, locally with skills for green industries, whether that be the building industry, the hydrogen industry, you know, there, there's new things that are developing. Um, farming, um, will, I mean, we'll, we'll be looking at, at uh, growing new things and, and how, sort of how to, how to do that and, and in new ways as well, which we're already, I know that there is uh, experimental um, activity um, underway uh, at CAFRI and so forth. Um, I think so, that there's a fear that, um, that there may not be as many new jobs as there are jobs being lost. I think that there is there is that sort of substantive fear that's out there. Um, I think so. What we can do is to, I mean, for example, building carbon literacy into the school curriculum is going to be vital to, to all this. We need to make sure that there's an understanding within our population on as to what the opportunities are and how we how we develop those. So, um, it, it's it's going to be a massive challenge. And I mean, this it's my concern is that there hasn't been really any uh, consideration given to the transitional element of this. And and I mean, certainly. Um, I know that um, NIAPA have come to you talking about a welfare bill for farmers. Um, uh, Robert has talked about potential pension for, for, for farmers that are on the verge of retirement. Um, we know that we need to sort of rethink how we do how we do food in, in Northern Ireland and make sure that we are more self-sufficient and we're not sort of bringing in the stuff that, that William was talking about from you know whatever country we're, we're, we're bringing it in from. Um, and I mean, we are in a particularly vulnerable position at the moment because of the changes to um, import and export Folks, relations. I'm going, to, uh, I'm going to stop here because it's 15 minutes since there's, we, have wait, we have witnesses in the waiting room for 15 minutes for the next session. And I don't want to be uh, ignorant. I'm cutting in there in time. It, is there any of this wound up? Please. So, 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 Chair, I mean, basically, I mean, it's, it's a massive challenge and um, I, we're willing to work with the committee and with, with the, the department on how to address that, uh, bearing in mind the, the uh, limited role that councils have in Northern Ireland and it's, that some of the, the issues that Claire raised there, that they're not something that are within council control, but we'll certainly work with partners and the community planning process and our planning um, officers and, and other functions to make sure that uh, we can address them as best we can. Okay. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, sir. I'm sorry for cutting it off here towards the end. I'm very conscious of our next witnesses. But sure. we'll hear from you again, no doubt. Um.
Chair, can I just on behalf of Nelga thank you very much for inviting us along today and uh, these discussions are, are needed for this climate change. Thank you. Yeah, uh, very robust discussion and uh, really appreciate you taking the time and giving us a written briefing as well. Uh, okay, so thank you very much, Councillor Burgess uh, and Karen. Okay, thank you. Okay, members, um, I'm going to move on now to uh, can I get agreement to publish the Nelga papers on the web page? Okay. Okay, members, item number 11, number 6, it's or 11 sessions from the Chartered Institute of Waste Management uh, on the Climate Number 1 Bill, and there's a briefing paper uh, has been tabled, and I want to welcome by Starleaf, Tim Walker, Chief Executive of ARC 21, and Ray uh, Parmenter, Head of Policy and Technical uh, CCIWM. I'd like to invite Representative 5 to 10 minutes to brief the committee, and then we'll ask questions. Okay, well, members, chair, thank you for the opportunity to meet you all this morning. Uh, this, uh, yeah, this morning, uh, we're just here to give you an update as to our views on uh, where waste could fit within climate change for for Northern Ireland, uh, as it's obviously a key issue. You've just heard Karen mention it. Uh, it's it's a very prescient issue for for us going forward, and our belief in the waste management sector is there is no way you'll be able to address climate change unless you started changing the actual economic models of production. And in that regard, we're talking about things like developing the circular economy. I have a bit of a slideshow, so I don't know if I present the slideshow to you on the screen or, or how I should do that. Uh, I'm in your hands. I think you have copies of it. Uh, I advise not to, but the members have it in their pack. Uh, we have it in the pack, so we have... Um, Tim, we, okay. members have it, we have it in the pack here, so we have... Um, right, well... well what I'll do then is I'll assume you've all got it in front of you and I'll, I'll talk through it quite quickly uh, okay. in order to get to the question and answer session you may have at the end. Okay. And yeah. basically, when we, look, when we look at the climate change bill, uh, we notice that from a waste management or waste and resources management perspective, uh, there's, uh, it recognizes the potential of methane and methane gas being, uh, being significantly a greater impact than just carbon dioxide. And over the time we look at, from a waste management perspective, Methane gas is something in the order of 80 to 85 times more impactful over a 20 year period than carbon dioxide. Um, it recognizes that international shipping may need to be included within target achievement. Uh, and that's a relevance because, as you heard Karen mention a minute ago, in the absence of infrastructure to deal with waste in Northern Ireland, we're in a position where we have to ship waste overseas. Um, the bill also proposes, proposes greater, public body, uh, greater, greater public body reporting and cooperation. Well, uh, waste management has, has worked pretty well in the past in, in Northern Ireland, uh, and I know that, uh, that, that John Blair had a question with regards to whether that could be finessed, developed, progressed beyond, and it is something where there has been some 20 years of experience of cooperation across, across Northern Ireland in waste management. But ultimately, in the bill, there's no specific reference to, to waste, which is slightly anomalous, given that, as I mentioned at the outset, uh, we don't believe that you'll be able to address climate change without tackling uh, the, economic, uh, the economic cycles of production and consumption, which link into, ultimately, waste production. Over the last couple of years, there's been a lot of reports, and more recently, than the last year, we've seen reports from the, the, uh, the Climate Change Commission, which recommends specifically that Northern Ireland ban key biodegradable waste streams from being landfilled from 2025. It also recommends to DEFRA that there is an export ban from 2030 for waste materials. In Northern Ireland, we have a lack of infrastructure. We continue to have a lack of infrastructure, and yet we're trucking on into the future without that sort of being placed in the context of what that means in the like of these kind of acts. Um, there may well also be a skills and resources gap between what we're aspiring to do and the actuality of it. And over the last year or so, I have been commenting about an issue about a crisis, which is not just to do with infrastructure, but is also to do with effectively a brain drain going on across the sector. And there is a risk, ultimately, that Northern Ireland falls further behind the other countries in that the lack of infrastructure in Northern Ireland means that we're increasingly reliant on others overseas to, to handle our wastes, our recyclates, for reprocessing purposes. Um, you know, along the way, yes, there's obviously a huge task in terms of bringing the public along this journey. The public tend to lose sight of waste once they place it in a bin or a box. And as far as they're concerned, it just disappears and becomes 
somebody else's issue. So we still have this really big problem in the sector of out of sight, out of mind. And in many regards, we continue to facilitate that by being unduly efficient in our job. And you can see that over the course of the last year with COVID, where notwithstanding effectively a profound change to our, to our way of living, the waste has continued to disappear uh, day in, day out, week in with that, week out, with not a lot of thought as to what's actually happening to it. And that's down to the really hard work uh, and the graft of, of many of uh, the councils who organize waste collection and those in the waste sector who, who magic the waste away after it's, it's arrived at their doors for treatment, for processing, for, for disposal. Um, in the process, that kind of out of sight, out of mind mentality means there is a lack of thought or recognition as the kind of jobs that could be supported, uh, that could be developed around uh, better use of our waste materials. Uh, and ultimately, there is scope that should these jobs come to pass, they're more likely to be more advanced in their underpinnings, more advanced around packaging, more advanced around processing. And therefore, there's the, possib the possibility and prospect of better paid jobs in this sector as we go forward into the future. The issue of net zero, these are all words to most people. I'm looking at my neighbors, I'm looking at my friends, you know, they're not big into much of this environmental stuff. It's scary, it's terrifying, and there is an increasing amount of uh, eco-anxiety amongst, uh, amongst the people I know. But ultimately, they're struggling to get to terms with what does this mean for them? And as we've just heard from some of the questions, <laughs> what does this mean for their quality of life? What does this mean for their job, their welfare? How are they actually going to uh, pivot towards some kind of new future? And how does that work? So I believe there is quite a bit of work needed around framing the ask coming down the pipeline from the likes of uh, the climate change bill and then where the circular economy fits within that. So people can begin to map out for themselves and have mapped out for them where their company, where themselves, where their business is going to go. Uh, and to rely and to leave that purely at the individual's foot is, is extremely worrisome individually and collectively. Um, the issue we have in our waste sector, as Karen has alluded to, because we're dealing with waste and it's considered to be uh, a, a tricky substance, certainly from local government, we have lots of experience about how we have used data and information to inform our, our performance and to inform our changes. That doesn't exist across all of the different waste streams. And in local government, we only generate between 10 and 12% of the overall waste in society. But nevertheless, data has ended up being a crucial element of what we do, what we manage, what we uh, use as a, as a linchpin for going forward. There are other sectors though in the waste that we need to have much better data. And Karen alluded to things like who is the oversight body? There does need to be much better tracking and trending of waste in the broader sphere agricultural wastes, clinical wastes, construction demolition wastes. Uh, many of these figures were relying on extrapolations from across the water, from, from England, Wales, Scotland, for the tonnages we're generating here. And the key thing here is, as we peel back and look at where our carbon emissions are coming from as a sector, we're finding 40, 50, 60% of the carbon emissions generated in waste management are actually upstream. They're prior to consumption. That needs to be addressed. And then once it comes to us, how can we make best use of it? And with the circular economy mindset on, the idea of having long, long supply chains, having a global uh, span for, for collection and disposal is ultimately running up right hard against the idea of minimizing your carbon footprint. Um, I've just mentioned about the globe. And you know, in that space, waste management is full of very professional wasters. They come with a rake of qualifications. Many come with very deeply held environmental beliefs. And for us, we recognize that climate change is going to change how we do business. And it's high time it changes. Um, we have been in far too often a janitorial role, sweeping up after everybody. And that has to change. So as a sector, our sectoral trade body, the Environmental Services Association, has recognized that 
we can go net zero. We'll have to invest money to do that in the commercial space. Upwards of 10 billion pound investment will be needed, but we can achieve that by 2040 if we really put the foot to the, to the, to, to the floor. It will require a degree of, of collaboration between governments internally, and there's issues there we have with the internal markets bill, which we commented on last year, and about how that could be used effectively to prevent some of these uh, greater, more advanced uh, environmental legislation coming to bear in uh, England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, and also UK internationally. And there's questions being asked about COP26 and what can be achieved through that, which I'll not go into now. We recognize in the waste sector that systemic change is necessary. And what we mean by that is an absolutely profound look at supply chain and supply chain management from point of production to point of disposal. And what else can we do in the middle to start minimizing our carbon footprint? Um, very cautious about claims about being world leading. Every country seeks to claim to be world leading. What we need to do is just do stuff. And this is a real problem we have. There's been far too much time spent on reviews, on considerations, on reports, and far too little time spent in the environmental space in terms of action. Ultimately, there needs to be a, an alignment, an international agreement. That will take time. In the meantime, the best way to de demonstrate performance is to, to move ahead. Uh, and there, in, in waste management terms, we have got great opportunity to do so, but it needs a more cohesive and a more coherent strategy from the top. I mentioned earlier on that climate change and the circular economy are int intimately linked. There is no way you can do climate change and climate change mitigation without looking at the carbon emissions that come from the, the supply chains. Uh, and as soon as you start looking at that, it raises a big question about just where is the point of intervention? A lot of what we consider about the circular economy falls into the waste management space because it seems like the most obvious place to, to place it. But ultimately, when you start looking at that circular economy piece, it filters its way all the way back up the supply chain and you get into things like Kaizen Blitz's Six Sigma statistical process control around the whole issues of manufacture before you even get down to the levels of use and consumption. There are issues here that for every tonne of waste we generate as a household, there's actually 10 tonne at least upstream. Zero Waste Scotland did recently did a study for Scotland, which showed that in Scotland, for every tonne of waste a household produced, there was 28 tonnes of waste created upstream. That whole production of waste generates carbon, even before you get to buy the product. There's various things here from recent circular economy report, which was uh, produced in 2021, which showed the global scale, the circular economy could reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 39%. It showed that the world was actually going into reverse on circularity and recyclability. The first study they produced in 2019, they had a recycling rate globally of 9.1%. When it was done again in 2021, when the exercise was rerun, we had fallen to 8.6%. And we've got issues like if food were the country, it would be the third largest in the world, according to greenhouse gas emissions. If clothing was a country, it would be the fourth largest emitter in the world, based on greenhouse gas emissions. We have these profound embedded carbon footprints in our consumption patterns, which we as the wasters pick up upon and have to deal with. Um, and increasingly we have to deal with that by creating product that we can bring back into the, uh, the, the production cycles. And that means effectively we're looking to um, intervene to, uh, to, to disrupt the existing supply chains. And that's heavy lifting because the existing producers do not want to be disrupted. So waste and resource emissions have reduced by 63% since 1990, almost greater than any other sector across the economy. And a vast amount of that is from landfill and better landfill capturing uh, of the gas and the use of that gas then for, for power production. But nevertheless, there's also been economies and step, step, uh, step through changes in terms of some of the uh, collection arrangements as well. However, our collections are still largely based on fossil fuels. And I wouldn't like to tell you the kind of miles per gallon we're getting from an RCV, a refuse collection vehicle. 
Department of Transport consultation on phasing out fossil fuel powered HGVs by 2040. It's, current, it's just closed. That will create a challenge to the sector. And again, I'm thinking of this from a local government sector. The, the tens, if not hundreds of millions of pounds needed nationally to affect that change have to come from somewhere. Never mind the supply chain about whether they're actually going to get all these vehicles. The actual cost of getting them is going to be profound. And given that an RCV, a refuse collection vehicle, costs between three, two and three times more expensive than a standard fossil fueled RCV, where is that money going to come from? Are the ratepayers going to pony up all this money? It's a big ask. In the meantime, emissions can be reduced using IT, using information technology, using uh, much better GIS and mapping technology to optimize fleet, to optimize, optimize collection arrangements and the like. And ultimately, as this, my, my uh, almost last slide highlights, the issue here has to be about getting maximum value from recyclates and waste as close to the point of production as possible. So you minimize the reverse carbon footprint in transport and logistics going somewhere else. For Northern Ireland, our specific issues are the circular economy has generational implications for waste. What we're seeing in that is the circular economy and the package that originally came out of Europe in 2015 spawned a whole series of things around extended producer responsibility, which is EPR, deposit return schemes, which is the old fashioned idea of bringing a milk bottle back to get some money for it. And as John, John Blair rightly asked, issues around consistency of collection. How is it that there are around 30 different collection mechanisms across the UK? That just doesn't seem to make sense. Yet collection is very much a local issue down to what works for each individual council. And a couple of years ago, uh, Rory Stewart, the then minister of DEFRA, tried to push the issue of consistency and it really fell on its face with huge political backlash at local and national level because it was felt this was a step too far. EPR and DRS are going to change the waste management world, but it will be a generational change. Extended producer responsibility means those who produce packaging materials in the system will be expected to pay for that packaging recovery, either through recycling or through general waste disposal at the back end. It's anticipated that this will generate something of the order of two to three million pounds per council per year for these, uh, this recovery. It's due to go live at the back end of 2023. Now, anyone who works in the farming sector will know that the big multiples and the big suppliers do not write you a check that comes with conditions. And I think the sector, the waste management sector, is grappling with what that may mean for them, which may well place the issue of consistency and standardization of collection at loggerheads with um, that representation of the people, that view of what the rate pair deserves or what's easiest for the rate pair. And that I think we're going to see play out in the next half a dozen years or so. There is a huge lack of policy connection between the rhetoric and the reality. We've seen a vast lack of investment in the sector and in infrastructure in critical areas across the UK. There's a lack of recycling technology. There's a lack of recovery technology. There's a lack of advanced manufacturing technology. And that is no truer than in Northern Ireland, where there's been a historic lack of investment. And the issue for us is that means that here in Northern Ireland, we are less resilient. We have been left behind in terms of self-sufficiency, reliant on overseas markets to deal with these materials. We're missing an opportunity to valorize our waste, to create jobs, to create employment, to create, uh, to contribute to the economy in a way that is more robust and more meaningful. Um, we also have this issue of illegality in Northern Ireland. Um, we have a land border. We've had waste move across the border for a number of years in the past, which was brought to light uh, in the, the early noughties and required a, a huge amount of repatriation of waste to, to uh, Republic of Ireland. We have found the, the big illegal landfill site outside of uh, at Campsie, uh, the Maboy site. Uh, and yet we have these recommendations which continue to filter out and are not going to get any less from the likes of the Climate Change Commission about landfill sites need to be much more tightly managed. Landfill gas needs to be used to generate electricity. 
better. Closed sites need to be managed for alternative uses. Many of our closed sites are in particularly difficult areas, such as on the, uh, the foreshore. I was responsible in my day for closing Dargan Road landfill site, the largest waste facility in Ireland. There's a similar site in, in uh, Londonderry. What, what happens with it? It's right on the coastline. And the one thing that climate change is promising us is sea level rise. Um, the issue with much of our bog lands were used effectively for landfill sites. How do we go about recovering those sites? Do we go into landfill mining to recover the recyclate, to standardize the waste, to reduce the landfill gas produced by it? And there is a question about whether there should be a specific, as, as Karen has just alluded to, a specific climate change commission or some other oversight body who is specifically re responsible for uh, holding people to account, holding organizations to account, holding others to account to, to see just what's going on and how we can do better. But the big thing arising for us in this sector is what we did five years ago, what we did 10 years ago, is going to change. And the issue for us is just which pieces of kit are going to be key to that and how we can best contribute to, and in many regards, lead on the charge uh, on some of these aspects. Uh, and that's it. I should say, raise with me from headquarters to give you a bit of an oversight as to what CIWM does. And I'm, I'm here as a, a trustee of CIWM and also a member of the local Senator Council. Uh, they kindly volunteered me to present to yourselves. So, so thank you for that opportunity. And I'll, I'll now uh, maybe give Ray just a few minutes to, to, to introduce himself and say who he is. Yeah, we, we need to move really, really quickly to questions. So we do, uh, but uh, if Ray wants to do an introduction, we need to move really quickly because we want to get 10 minutes for questions. Ray, I think you're on mute. Oh, I think Ray's on mute. Oh, is that better? Yeah. That's it, right, technology's working. Sorry, no, yes, um, Ray Palmer, Head of Policy Technical at the CLWM. Uh, we're a member organisation, we've been around for over 100 or odd years, five and a half thousand members across the whole sector of waste management, uh, from regulators all the way through to operators, local authorities, etc. So, yeah, I'm quite happy to skip over everything else. If you need to ask me any questions about CRW, then please do. Perfect, thank you. We have a number of uh, people here who want to ask questions. I'll move first to Claire. Claire Bailey. Thanks very much, Claire. Uh, I'm glad that there was so much in what you were saying, Tim. Thank you for that. And I maybe want to link it to, you know, where Karen, I think you, we're getting to there, you mentioned that at the end there. So we were hearing from Nilga there about, you know, how do we, how are we held accountable? You know, how do we have that level of oversight in Northern Ireland and whether our systems currently are fit for purpose in doing that? Um, so we know climate change is changing everything. Absolutely, you know, business as we've always done it has ceased and we now need to build new ways into sustainable pathways. And when you're mentioning methane emissions and you're talking about illegal dumps and you Maybe it's only one, but we know of many, many others. Um, do you feel, for example, that even DERA would have robust enough or strong enough or adequate enough policies or structures in order to deal with that, even in the methane, but in the illegal dumping element in both? I, I think it's a, it's a, really, a really pertinent question. I, I think the likes of NIEA struggle with resourcing. Uh, and then the relationship they have with others, the likes of HMRC and the likes of PSNI, and just how that relate, how that relationship works, and and how to get hands on things like the proceeds of crime. So the money in the system, where does the money in the system come to pay for the regulations? How sacrosanct is that money? How easy is it to, is it to, to soften up and surrender? We've seen from looking at across the water, and Ray will know this better than I. The Environment Agency in England and Wales has been absolutely cored, arising from the austerity agenda from two thousand and seven. And the real concern is the regulator is almost like the first point of call to remove or reduce resourcing, to make cost savings, because it's an immediate win. And the, the concern is that that could happen or will happen here, and we just don't have sufficient resources to police the environment properly. 
And we're seeing also that brings in the whole Office of Environmental Protection. I won't go into that now, but the Office of Environmental Protection is linked to the Environment Bill, which is struggling its way through the House of Lords, House of Commons. And every time the, the House of Lords makes uh, amendments and revisions to strengthen it, the House of Commons seeks to reduce or remove those. And we're into our fourth reading of it now. It's a shocking state of affairs and really undermines any claims Britain has of being world leading. Uh, it really puts it to the it really puts it to the to the crux, uh, and the issue we have here in terms of Northern Ireland is: Are there sufficient resources in this space? The answer is no. Is there sufficient policy in this space? Kind of. Is the policy sufficiently connected? Is it su sufficiently interlinked? The answer is no. It is not. You have very small teams working flat out to deliver a specific pieces of legislation with almost no thought as to how those pieces relate to other pieces of legislation. And it relies on the likes of the institution to try to hold a mirror up and say, have you not considered where this piece of legislation about climate change relates to a piece of legislation, say, around the Environment Bill or a piece of legislation around the removal of vehicles or changes to vehicle taxation? And I don't see any of that being done internally within, within DERA, within DFI and the like. And that creates a great burden on what is basically the likes of me in my role as an Institute of Waste Management uh, trustee or, or uh, centre councillor, a voluntary or part-time role. So they see in terms of, so we'll talk a lot about joined up working and the need to have that. So if we move to a, a joined up working, obviously that's going to need joined up resourcing uh, and we have issues such as waste for example still sitting firmly within DERA but when you're talking about the circular economy is when you're talking about tackling climate change when you're talking about moving into new systems that's going to be cross-cutting uh, and cross-departmental so circular economies dealing with waste lots of opportunities in there lots of industry opportunities job creation industry wealth building opportunities so in your if, Experience. Is there any indication, so we know climate change is happening, this is not a new thing, just because code red for humanity has been declared, and is there anything in your experience that indicate that the, our executive are taking this on board? Have they started to plan for the likes of future investment or cross-joined up resourcing of the base infrastructure? Uh, again, it's a, it's a really, really salient point. I mean, the issue is, uh, it's been misattributed to, to Einstein. Uh, to, to do a different thing and expect to do a, to do the same thing and expect a different result is the definition of insanity, uh, and that there's a risk that we keep on doing the same thing and expecting to get a different result. What's, what we're beginning to see is uh, I was appointed to the Circular Economy Network, working with some 50 other people uh, as part of a department for uh, economic a department for economy a task force looking to say, how do we start to create new bodies, new institutions, new arrangements, new relationships to move the circular economy more mainstream into Northern Ireland? It involves practitioners, it involves uh, academics, it involves um, uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and it involves a few sort of policy wonks, so I guess of which I would be one. Uh, and it's sort of saying, how do we make this happen? How do we actually deliver this in a way that means Northern Ireland can move into 21st century. Okay. Thank you for that, uh, Tim and Claire. Um, I'm going to move over to John. John Blair. It's frozen, John. Yeah, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Tim. And, and thank you, Tim, also for the earlier shout out. Um, <laughs> Back to the uh, circular economy conversation and the, the reference in your report, uh, and, and as I say, we're, we're grateful for the report that climate change will not be achieved without the circular economy bring it be, becoming the predominant method of consumption and production. Can, can I refer to, to that and, and link it directly to waste management? You have heard me before, I mentioned it earlier about um, even within a single council area, glass being collected at one door but not another. And relate that directly to a facility in my own constituency at Tomb, um, involved in recycling glass and as part of that process in Derry Lynn County Fermanagh. Both areas very much in need of, of those green jobs. C can I ask you then what the, the Institute can do to try to ensure that consistency 
um, across local government and whether or not having a fractured waste management system and structure is beneficial or a hindrance? Well, you know, to some extent, this, this, is, this is almost a point for Ray because we are a member-based organisation. As such, we, we look to reflect upon uh, what is good and best practice and draw that to the attention of the members. And it's then for the members themselves to see how they can mobilise that into what they do and how they apply it in their workplace. Mm -hmm. um, so what, what we've done in terms of local government is there's been a variety of papers done to highlight how waste collection can be done or should be done, but ultimately relies on the individuals within councils to reflect upon and to determine would this work, could this work for us, and then to engage with the politicians of that area to say what works. And what we see is it's a bit like the swing of a ball. Whenever you swing the, the pendulum, it swings a certain distance before it begins to come back. And for a long time, you know, and it's a slight, a slight deviation what Karen said earlier on, where, where, where we started on waste was we were on a massive race to get as many tons as possible, to get these 25% recycling, 40% recycling, 50% recycling targets. And ultimately, it didn't really matter a whole whit how we did it, as long as we met these pure weight-based targets. There was no consideration given to what the, uh, the actual um, tonnage was. It was all to do with percentage performance. There was no consideration or very little consideration given at a local government level as to what was the aim of meeting a 40% recycling target. Even now, if you ask half the council officers, what's the aim of meeting 50% recycling, 60% recycling? How does that relate to waste percentages, waste tonnages? And most will not frame it in line with, well, it's to do with measure the level of, of consumption, it's to do with diverting waste away from, uh, away in such a manner that it can adequately com uh, contribute to the, the development of an economy. It's simply a target. I have to get to 60% recycling, come hell or high water, give me all your paving stones. Doesn't matter whether they've got a carbon impact or not, give me your paving stones because they're nice and heavy and I need tonnage to make it up. Never mind the plastic, because the plastic's lightweight. So we have done a mishit in terms of identifying what's, impro what's important, because it could be that for some councils or some areas, some of those targets are daft. What we need to be doing is driving down the level of waste we're generating on a personal level. At the minute, we're 465 kilograms per person per year, according to 2019, 2020 figures. That's almost half a ton per person with a multiplier in Scotland of 28 times for what's produced upstream. This is bonkers stuff. We need to be pulling our, our, our waste production down to much lower levels. And that's what I mean about generational. So bringing it back to what you were asking about tomb and dairy land, it becomes really crucial to say, how can we maximize what is being collected? How can we intervene with councils to say, we need you to get certain materials? How can either the sector work with councils or how can the state, DERA, mandate changes? Now remember, there'll be a big pushback if DERA begins to say, we want you to do this or we're instructing you to do this. Can you see the minister do it? We're instructing you to collect glass in this following manner. Yeah. It's not a question anymore, it's an instruction. Yeah. Um, it, it's that kind of thing, because at the minute, when it's left up to individuals to determine with their political colleagues, the reality is it has been a race for weight. And we've yeah. gone for 20 years down that road, and now we're trying to say, is it the right weight? And that's yeah. proving difficult to unpick. Okay, th th thanks Tim for that, uh, and I'm pleased to hear you refer to the, the issues of uh, quality of product as well as quantity of product in relation to the, the green economy. Um, on, on a separate issue, and not, not to put all of the pressure on, or, or a reasonable amount of pressure on the Institute, but could I ask you, a, a particular bugbird of mine is, is illegal waste, whether that's littering, um, fly tipping or, or large scale industrial and um, illegal dumping. Um, what, what pressure has been brought to bear, can be brought to bear on government to try and ensure that we don't continue in this cycle of all of this being, you, you use the term sweep, sweeping up, um, that all of this is being swept up at public expense. Um, so, so, see, before you answer that, Tim, just I wonder, could it be possible 
be as succinct as possible because we're over time and we have an hour speaker as well. So go ahead, just to, just to keep it moving. <laughs> okay, <laughs> thanks for keeping me on my toes. Um, yeah, the, the legislation coming down the pipeline from the extended producer responsibility places that cost for the production of packaging on the producer. Much of the packaging ends up on the street, on the high street, uh, being discarded. And the idea is that suddenly Wrigley's, suddenly Lucas, suddenly Pringles will be expected to pay the councils for a proportion of their cleanup costs. Now, Ray, I, I, I'm going to stop and say, Ray, is there anything you want to add to that? Just very second. Yeah, um, the, the deposit return scheme should absolutely have some influence on that as well, I think, Tim. Um, that, that would encourage um, people to actually take the packaging back for uh, an economic return so they wouldn't be quite so encouraged to litter it in the first place. That's one of the principles behind the DRS scheme. So, yeah, and then that would be funded as well by the producers to some extent as well. So, yeah, there, there are moves afoot, but um, there's also been a lot of work done by the institution on illegal waste and, and, and crime, or particularly around organised crime. And we've been involved in a several reports on that over the last couple of years, highlighting this to government and the, and the problems it causes and the links of that, that, that crime has into other areas, particularly around um, drugs and money laundering and those kinds of activities. So it's just a broader activity. So we've encouraged the regulators and um, the, 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 uh, the enforcement authorities to collaborate more, more closely, particularly around police, HMRC, and those sorts of background bodies to sort of collaborate around that sort of coalesce around that kind of activity. So they did more uh, sort of holistic join up, so they follow the money trail to some extent as well, and increase the proceeds of crime um, uh, sort of monies coming back to the, the regulators and that kind of thing. Yeah. So okay. I hope you know. Okay. Okay. Question. okay. Right. Okay. Thanks. Thank you for that there. Okay. Um, the, the last speaker, I'm going to have to finish before 12, is Patsy. Patsy Malone. Yeah, thanks very much, Chair. I'll be very succinct um, because I'm conscious of the pressure to take on. Just if I could add maybe some of those energy drinks to the, the list that you just mentioned, the boosts and red bulls of this word, uh, Tim. Seems the only energy that it generates is the energy to <laughs> chuck it out the front of your car. But um, they are really, really a big, big issue. And uh, the litter packs that have been organised in community level seem to be just it's constant it's absolutely constant and i don't understand the disrespect people have for the countryside but i had a number of questions but just one um it'll be very helpful to me uh, now you mentioned there earlier about the one ton of waste per family and that upstream that in actuality is 28 ton you refer to something about scotland there could you just expand a little bit on that for me please just as to how that uh, one sure. to 28 ratio uh, is composed basically uh, that was that was a recent report for Zero Waste Scotland. Zero Waste Scotland is an advisor to the Scottish Government. So they did a study to look at, at the amount of, of waste that was produced in the production of final product. So that's the amount of soil moved, it's the amount of rock crushed, it's the amount of wood cut down, the shavings, everything else, that, the amount of water that's done in terms of washing away the, 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 uh, the chemicals when it's making cloth or cotton or whatever it is. It's all those discards that happen upstream before the product gets to you. So ultimately, everything you have, and I'm holding up a little squeegee ball here, my stress ball, everything you have has got a shadow upstream of carbon yes. and of waste. Uh, the example I have used for years is that we have a multiplier of 10 for Britain. My concern was the zero waste study when they looked into it in detail, which was last year, showed it was actually 28 for Scotland. So for every tonne that I produce, there's 28 tonnes that I have not seen. Okay. That's great. And perhaps it'd be useful, Chair, if we could get a link to that report. Uh, I know we'd like to dip into it and have a wee bit of a, a nosy around that report, please, just, okay? Yeah. Thanks very much indeed, gentlemen, for your time, the Tim and Ray there. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much, Tim and Ray, um, either through the committee or maybe Tim or Ray, maybe that link. Certainly, uh, we'll do that, Chair. We can get that link, Patsy, I'm sure. Um, 
Well, I want to I want to thank you. That that was very detailed and very very interesting, and you, you gave us a lot of food for thought. I want to thank you for your attendance today. Apologise, uh, just we were in the waiting room to be to begin with, and but uh, hopefully we made up for the time towards the end. Uh, so I want to seek agreement from members to publish the CIWM paper on the web page. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much, Tim and Ray. Now. Okay. Okay, members. Going to move. I, I, Karen, I see you again. Okay, members, going to move on to the next item, number uh, seven on the agenda. Oral evidence from the department on the horse racing amendment bill. Uh, the briefing paper is at page 43, and advice from the examiner statutory rules to the committee for uh, uh, for the delegated legislative powers within the bill at page 45. I ask members to note that the advice is marked as restricted and is for the information of the committee only. A copy of the bill has been provided at page 49. Members will also recall that following the presentation from our research department on the bill, a letter was issued to the department outlining a number of queries. A copy of the responses can be found in the table of papers. I want to welcome by Starleaf, uh, John Tarrington, who is the head of the bill team, Dr Samantha Stewart, deputy head uh, of the bill team. I want to invite uh, the officials to give a five-minute uh, brief uh, to the committee. And then we'll ask questions. Okay, John, Samantha, who have we got here? Samantha's just dropped out. We have John here, do we? Good morning. I, I, I'm here. Can you hear me? Yeah, okay? Yes, John. Thank you very much. Um, um, good, good morning, um, Chair. Good morning, members. Um, uh, thank you again for an opportunity to present um, to the, uh, the the committee on the on the horse racing amendment bill. Uh, as you say, I'm joined online today by, by my colleague, Dr. Samantha Stewart. The last time um, officials spoke to the committee on this, the bill had just been introduced to the assembly. And with the support of the committee, it subsequently passed its second stage and moved to committee stage. More recently, the department wrote to the committee summarising the papers provided by the department with respect to the bill, including, as um, Mr Chairman, you, you've noted, uh, the response to the queries raised by members following the committee's consideration of the uh, assembly report, the raised report on the bill. Members are therefore hopefully um, aware of the scope and the details of the bill which is being brought forward in order to allow for reinstatement of payments from the horse racing funds to both Northern Ireland uh, race courses. Um, and this would be in line with the aims of the horse racing order and allows for continuation of support provided for by that legislation for around 30 years. As members will recall, the order names the operator of each race course as beneficiaries to the fund. However, it's not been possible to provide support from the fund to Down Royal since the change in management of that course in 2019. And it's that key matter that the bill seeks to address. As a consequence of UK subsidy control rules, is the Department suggests that it is also not possible to fund Downpatrick without the proposed amendment, as doing so would potentially create unfair competition in the market. At the Bill's second reading, members picked up on a number of issues raised during the Department's consultation, some of which will likely have been raised again during the Committee's call for evidence. Among other issues, this included the potential to extend payments into the fund from online betting, the extension of the scope of the fund to support racing outside the two current name location, and indeed in support of Greyhound Racing. I will not dwell on these matters now, as they will come up during uh, discussions and scrutiny. However, as set out when we last briefed the committee and also by the Minister during the second stage debate, where the clear and immediate priority is to reinstate payments to both local race course as soon as possible, it is recognised that a more fundamental review of the legislation will also be necessary. Such as you will look to pick up on many of the issues raised by consultees and in the Assembly debate. However, key to this is an issue that is outside the Department's responsibility, fundamental to any review, namely the licensing of online bookmakers. Given the relationship between the fund and the licensing of bookmakers, it will not be practical to make major changes until that issue is fully considered by the Department for Communities. At this point, I want to mention briefly an amendment to the bill that Hopeman hopes to make, uh, hopes to table, and which has been shared with the committee. The amendment will add a transitional provision that is necessary to ensure the payments can be reinstated as soon as the bill is enacted. We're happy to address any queries on this alongside um, consideration of the bill itself, of course. Um, as well as the proposed amendment, amendments, members will have seen the bill, the AFM that comp accompanies it. Um, while the most recent data letter also provided a short clause by clause summary of the bill. Um, I'm happy, Mr Chairman, to take the members through the details of the clause that make up the, the bill, uh, if that's the wish of the committee. If not, I, I can move to, to, to conclude. Um, would, would you like me to go through them? For I am aware of the, the pressures, of t pressures of time. Um, 
any members of any of you do you want to go through the clauses? Because I'm conscious we do have the, the, the bill here and the details. If members want to go through the clauses? Okay. Uh, I think perhaps maybe uh, would you be okay then maybe to take a, any questions in? Uh, yes, yeah, sure. Um, just, I'll, I'll just briefly conclude then. Obviously, we can discuss, I was happy to, to, to explain each of the clauses um, uh, throughout the, 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 the committee scrutiny, um, uh, uh, if not now. But we'll conclude by saying the bill aims to amend the beneficiary of Down Royal and doing so allow for um, payments to both of his courses as in business in 1990 and for the most part to us to do nothing, anything else beyond this. I hope this given the committee a quick recap of the bill's aims and content, and with no doubt the committee will discuss in more detail over the next few weeks. In the meantime, as I say, yes, Mr Chairman, happy to take any questions. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, John. Um, we're doing, um, um, one of the uh, things, John, that was raised by a number of two, two stakeholders, I believe, was the fact that um, the payments will be being made to uh, profit making enterprise. Uh, what is the um, you know, what's the department's view on that? There, Are those concerns have raised. Um, the department doesn't see any particular issue with this. Um, there's no restriction regarding the type of operator that may receive support uh, in the 1919 order, um, the 1919 order itself. Um, um, I don't think there's any reason why they shouldn't. Um, it sets out the money must be used to support of the race courses um, in those two locations, um, and there are certain controls like operators are required to provide business plans to the department in addition to their annual accounts. Uh, so, so the use of the money is, is clearly audited uh, for and uh, for um, uh, to, to meet those to meet the requirements of the legislation and support horse racing at at, at that course or those courses. Um, so again, I say we don't think there's any 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 bar on it. Uh, and tell me, um, do you see the uh, in terms of the wider strategic review of license fee charges to, for to bookkeepers? Have you had any recent conversations with the Department of Communities in respect of this? Um, sorry about the the the, the license fee yeah. um, that uh, the fee that um, uh, bookmakers themselves have to play to be licensed in Northern Ireland. Is that is that the question? Uh, yes, the wider review with the Department of Communities. Yeah. Well, on the wider review, yes, I mean, we have kept in touch with um, with, uh, with 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 the Department of Communities uh, throughout their review, and, and we've made we've made comments on it and, and back and forward. Uh, as it as it turns out, um, our understanding is that um, whilst whilst they're um, taking forward a review of the of the of the legislation that um, that governs licensing, um, the issue of the definition of a licensed uh, bookmaker. Um, isn't to be included in uh, the first um, uh, stage of, of, of the amendments to that, that which uh, I understand the, is, is in legislative draft or legislative form that the, um, the executive has agreed to, to um, introduce to the, uh, to the assembly. Um, so it doesn't. It, it does a number of things, um, none of which directly uh, uh, cross cut with with the Irish responsibilities or, or with the the horse racing fund. Um, but I think both ministers, um, in bringing forward both pieces of legislation to the executive, agreed that it was necessary to, to, to work together um, in the longer term. Um, uh, where, where issues do where issues do overlap. Um, so so that 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 would be an ongoing that'd be an ongoing process. But I say isn't isn't. Um, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, the, 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 the bit that does overlap isn't isn't um, uh, in, in going to happen in the short term within DFC's review. And do you see then, it's not just sort of relation to that as well. Well, I'm aware this fund is to restore the 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 funding to the the race courses, both race courses. Has there been any further steps with a view to expand the scope, for example, to Greyhound race courses, for example? Uh, I think in the first instance, um, uh, as, you, as you note and, and as my introduction noted, that, that, that the aim of, of this legislation was, was, was very narrow um, and looked at, at the, the horse racing order and to amend it um, uh, 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 and within that. Um, to expand that to greyhounds or, 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 any, or anywhere else, I think, would be subject to a a fundamental review, um, which I mentioned and which the Minister has mentioned, um, in the sense that you would have to look at the relationship between um, gambling and, and, and um, 
uh, and, and greyhound racing. Um, you would have to look at um, uh, yeah, the, 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 how the fund is collected and how the fund is paid out. Um, that said, um, we have been working on some round work, um, I think, um, to, to the aim of putting terms of reference to, to a review of a review to the Minister at, 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 at some point. Um, it, it's very complicated stuff in terms of looking at the relationship between all of these pieces, um, uh, but, but that doesn't mean we, we shouldn't be doing it. Um, and again, I conclude that ultimately the key thing um, would be the life review which sits with DFC and, and any major review that we take forward would, would have to sit in light of, of their definition of um, uh, licensed gambling, licensed uh, bookmakers in Northern Ireland. Perfect. Um, check here. Thank you very much for that. Um, okay. Okay, thank you. Then um, that, that, that's very helpful uh, in terms of our ongoing scrutiny of this here. And I want to thank uh, uh, both um, both of yourselves, uh, John and Samantha, for attending here this morning. Okay, thank you. Oh, you're, you're very welcome. Um, we, of course, remain on hand to deal with any other queries that come up during the, um, the um, committee's uh, uh, gathering of evidence from, from other stakeholders. Thank you very much. Perfect, thank you. And can I get agreement from the committee to publish the Department of Racing paper on the website? Okay. Okay, members, uh, as we have dealt with correspondence at the beginning of the meeting and the forward work programme as well, I'm going to ask uh, members, do they have any other business they want to raise? Let's see anything coming up on the WhatsApp facility? Um, Okay, members, uh, just obviously just re remind you obviously that we've got the Balmore show uh, next week and the committee will be, has been invited to attend that on the Wednesday and no doubt some of us will be there other days as well. So, uh, members, the date, uh, the date and time of the next meeting is next Thursday, 23rd at 10 a.m. Again, this will be a hybrid meeting streamed on the web family website. Um, but don't just go just yet because we're going to just move into a closed uh, session to consider some strategic planning issues for the committee. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Committee Room.